Hello, everyone. I'm Jamie Marisota, CEO of Lumina Foundation. I want to thank you for joining us for what I know is going to be an engaging one-on-one -on -one discussion with uh, my friend and colleague, retired admiral and former uh, Supreme Allied, a Allied uh, Commander of NATO, Jim Stavridis. Welcome, Jim. Admiral Stavridis, looking forward to our conversation. So am I. Um, always good when you get a couple of uh, Greek Americans together, you know you won't run out of conversation. Exactly. We're, we're going to try to keep it tight so that we can uh, uh, not follow our uh, uh, cultural um, uh, predispositions to uh, uh, expound a little too deeply. Um, you know, I want to just mention a few things about Admiral Stavridis and his uh, accomplishments. Um, he's a graduate of the Naval Academy. He served in the U.S. Navy for 37 years, rising to the rank of four-star admiral. And uh, among his many uh, commands were four years, as I mentioned as the 16th Supreme Allied Commander at NATO, uh, where he oversaw operations in Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, the Balkans, and uh, countered piracy off the coast of Africa. He was the longest serving combatant commander in recent US history. He earned a PhD from the Fletcher School of Diplomacy at Tufts University, uh, as well as academic honors from the National and Naval War Colleges as a distinguished student. And uh, following his career in the military, he served for five years as the 12th dean of the Fletcher School, which is uh, actually when we first connected. Uh, Admiral, you may remember you and I, um, you reached out to me. <clears throat> you reached out to me um, in your role, and um, I've been delighted to, uh, to stay connected ever since. Uh, uh, he's a best-selling New York Times author. He's published 10 books. He's a managing director and vice chairman, global affairs of the Carlyle Group, a uh, global investment firm, and he's currently the chair of the board of trustees of the Rockefeller Foundation. So our discussion today is going to focus on uh, human work and national security, and I think it's going to draw some insights from our respective roles, including what uh, I think is three we happen to have in common. One is that we're both leaders whose careers address the intersection of learning, service, and work, and, and their direct connection to improving our society and nation. Another is that we both happen to be authors of recent books that speak to human characteristics and traits. And, and the third, you already mentioned, Jim, which is that based on our last names, uh, we're uh, of Greek de descent and we're each proud of our Greek heritage and its role in shaping our personal ethos, though we both have different immigrant uh, experiences that are probably worth uh, talking about. So, Admiral, again, welcome. Let me, let me start by just asking you uh, a little bit about um, learning and serving. My, my entire leadership path has really focused on helping a lot more people, diverse in, in every way, to learn, to earn, to serve others with the aim of empowering our economy, strengthening our democracy, advancing equity and justice for every American. And, and you and I have both written about the importance of service and learning. Your entire career has been about that. So when did you come to value learning and service, and, and is there a story behind that? Well, first and foremost, Jamie, thank you, as we would say, Afkaristo, for having me on the Mara program. Kalo. <laughs> and um, secondly, thank you for being a mentor to me as I made the transition after a long misspent youth in the Navy, 37 years, and became dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts. Um, you were kind enough in your roles uh, leading in higher education to be someone I could call upon for advice, for guidance, um, as well as for friendship. And so um, I compliment you on your career and lifetime of service. A lot of people don't know this. You were foundational in creating AmeriCorps here in the United States of America. Um, you have a, a similar trajectory in life, I think, as I do. So this will be a fun conversation. So I bet it'll start for me the same way it started for you, which is, growing up as a boy. I was uh, the son of a career military officer. Uh, my mom was a relentless volunteer everywhere we went, transferring around the world. We lived in Athens for three years, as a matter of fact. And so I grew up in a household that valued service and also, as is typical in a Greek home, education. And I knew from my earliest days that I would want to work hard um, in order to make contributions in service and ultimately in the world of education. Interesting to note, my father, who was the first generation Greek American in our family, uh, born here, um, he had a long career in the US Marines, retired as a colonel, and then he became the president of a community college and did that for 10 years. So I really fathered, 
followed in my father's footsteps, career of service in the military, and then service, I hope, in the world of higher education as well. So for me, it began as a child. How about you? You know, for me, I, uh, my mother was a, uh, an immigrant. My mother was born on the island of Crete. Uh, her family went back and forth between the U.S. and, and Greece. Uh, they weren't sure that they wanted to stay in America. Um, and uh, so some of her siblings were born here. She was born there. And uh, my, my father was born in New Hampshire, but my father in many ways was uh, more Greek than my mother uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, he spoke uh, Greek as his first language. Uh, my father actually, until he died in 2015 at the age of 93, he still read and wrote in Greek um, uh, as, a, uh, as someone who was born in, a, in America, pretty amazing, as a high school dropout. Uh, but, you know, we, we grew up with that same sort of set of cultural values, the importance of education. I tell people all the time, my parents didn't know what college was except for one thing, that I and my three brothers were going. Uh, <laughs> they knew that that was the path to greater success and, and opportunity for, for all of us. My parents were working class. We grew up as a working class family, and, and I feel uh, very fortunate to have uh, had my uh, parents as guides and anchors in, in our work going forward. And, and what they really did, Jim, was they, they helped me and my, my brothers hone our human traits and, and concentrate our life's work on things that really make us successful as members of, of, of a community, successful in terms of, of leading our families, et cetera. And, you know, I was thinking about, uh, reread your book, Sailing True North, uh, recently, and, and you, you write a lot about this issue, and in particularly about the importance of character and those characteristics that go into effective leadership. And one of the things I, I remember from the book is you have this line that says, adherence to moral and ethical behavior, trustworthiness, honesty, caring about others, being kind to others, having empathy and putting yourself in the shoes of others. That's really key. You know, to me, those are all highly human traits that we're going to need to leverage uh, in this increasingly technology-mediated world that I wrote about in, in my book. Do you think those traits can be taught? I do. And I think that um, back to foundational experiences, we, we begin with our families. And here it's a very broad brush. Some people are lucky to be in um, households, if you will, that sail true north. Others, maybe not so much. And so um, if you're lucky enough to come out of a household that inculcates those kind of values, you're a bit ahead. But here's the point of your question. Can you learn it, no matter what your beginnings are? And I think history shows us that you can, that people come from very broken homes, from very challenging circumstances, from very underserved neighborhoods, and yet they go into a school system, for example, and they become a protege of a teacher. Maybe they get a job, and they're working for a boss who sails true north. Maybe they come into a, a program, um, everything from the Boy Scouts to volunteering at the local food bank. That helps you learn and develop. And, and I'll conclude on this by saying reading, the value of reading. Once you learn how to read, you open a gateway to the universe. And, and so many of the experiences that I have had, in addition to that lucky foundational piece, in addition to the education that I was privileged to receive, many have come to me through literature. Every book is a kind of time machine that takes you back to some other period, takes you ahead in the case of science fiction. Every book is a simulator. You drop yourself into it and you're reading To Kill a Mockingbird, a book that I think is still read appropriately in, in almost every high school curriculum, you drop yourself in that book and you ask yourself, if I were Atticus Finch, would I have the courage, the integrity to swim against the stream in this small town in the South and overcome those challenges to do the right thing? You can learn a lot from literature as well. So Jamie, I think it's all those things contribute to um, how we learn and grow as leaders, but in particular, as people of character. Yeah, your point about reading, I think, is really well taken. Um, I, I wrote another book a few years uh, uh, back called America Needs Talent. And one, one of the points I tried to make in, in that book is that 
talent is this combination of things. Mm. It's it's uh, the result of both your experiences and your formal learning, and they come together in a way that not only transforms your life, but contributes to societal change and progress and, and improvement. And so, you know, reading is a good example of that. You can read as part of formal learning, but reading is a part of what develops you as an individual, and that combined with your work experience, I think, is 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 really key. And you know, I I spend um uh, I've spent the majority of my career focused on trying to get more people into and through high quality learning opportunities, formal learning opportunities post high school, uh, particularly you know uh, people of color, uh, low income populations, etc. And you know, you were you were a dean of a, a very important um, um, entity at Tufts University for for five years. What's your view of how we are doing in higher education? Are we preparing our learners for the world of the future, for the work of the future? And, and what should we be doing better, Jim? I think we are a mixed bag at this point. So some things that I think are going well in higher education is an enhanced attention to society outside the academy. Um, we are doing better at, at addressing some of these issues of moral justice, um, issues of historical um, injustices and, and, and creating systems that can overcome them. We are doing better at that aspect of things. Number two, I think we're doing better at technology. And um, here, this may be the ultimate silver lining in this horrible two-year pandemic, is that it has wrenched the academy in a direction it was already going, which is to distribute knowledge more broadly using platforms exactly like we're doing now. When I was dean, I went to my uh, faculty and I pitched them on, okay, um, you know, as we steer into this 21st century, I think it's time we use technology to offer more distributed opportunities doing this kind of teaching. And, and you would have thought I was uh, walking into that faculty uh, meeting and they were looking at me like he should have gone through a metal detector before you let him in here because he's crazy. <laughs> um, and yet here we are now and every school in the country has now wrenched itself into this kind of brave new world. And boy, are we enormously better than where we were a couple of years ago. So I think that's an area that we're improving in pretty significantly. Where I think we are continuing to struggle is ensuring that students complete their degrees. We still have terrible dropout rates in many institutions of higher education. Part of this ties into another area of real concern, which is mental health of students. Um, and that, I think, has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and is an area where uh, higher education needs to put more resources, more effort. I think those two things are tied together. And then, Jamie, something you and I have gone back and forth on, I think well understood, is the cost of higher education is still too high, out of reach in many instances. You know, see paragraph one about how we could use technology to uh, distribute opportunity more widely. You know, your book on talent is brilliant. And, you know, the good news is talent is distributed universally, but opportunity is not. And thus, the more we can create opportunity to, to make that mega talent that you talk about in the book um, available broadly, the better we'll be as a society. So mixed picture, both some pros and cons. We still have work to do in higher education. Yeah, and I, I think your your point, which is that we need to be thinking about uh, the way in which this system, whether it's the cost, the use of the technology, all the things that you talked about, is actually coming together over the course of people's entire lifetimes in order to serve their own development, but also our our shared outcomes as a society. And you know, we we uh, I think in in your and my youth, uh, there was probably a time when this idea of a school, the college to work pathway was something that a lot of people understood. But now it seems that those pathways are 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 broken or at least changing because of some of the factors that, that you talked about. And you know, I've been an advocate for a long time for this new kind of learning system that does take advantage of technology, new learning media, et cetera, 
but also sort of breaks down these barriers of the ways in which we tend to think about, well, education is here and training is there. You know, all learning is about helping to make us better as individuals and helping to make us better as people who work, um, who seek to, make, to, to do better, you know, make a living, et cetera. And to me, I think that that uh, combination of learning, working, serving others, to me, that's what human work is all about. But I think it, it integrates uh, a wide range of learning that, that the human work ecosystem really requires. In other words, it's got to happen however or wherever it takes place. So, you know, how do you think about this? How, what do you think we need to do to remain competitive in the world where it seems like those pathways are broken or, or, or being rebuilt, depending on, on your perspective? And, and how do we make sure that we remain competitive in a world where work is changing, the world is becoming more dangerous, lots of things are, are changing around us? Well, first, and this may or may not surprise you, we need to put more responsibility on the individual themselves. Because think about these supercomputers we carry around. With this device in my hand, I have access to all the world's knowledge. I have access to every symphony ever written. I have access to every bit of the information I need. So I think what we need to do is put the capability and the training in the hands of the individuals, but then give them a sense that you've got to figure this out using those technologies. Another way to think about this is we tend to send people off to higher education with the idea that they will go to a four-year school and every uh, four months someone will hand them a piece of paper with a list of eight books and they will go and read those eight books and then they will go sit as though they were in the classroom with Socrates, you know, 2,500 years ago, and a, a mentor will declaim to them and explain these eight books. I, I'm not sure that's the right model anymore, particularly in this age. So how can we empower individuals to understand that, sure, they may want to go and do that spoon-fed four-year program, fine, but in my view, your education really begins the day you own it, the way you are picking the eight books you want to read every six months, which is not a bad goal, by the way. Um, and what are you doing as an individual? So, so that's kind of point one. And then point two is considering how government can help. And here, I like a lot, and I'm very curious your thoughts. I know you've studied this hard. I like what I see from Europe. Here I think the Europeans have a very different mindset um, that blends training, apprenticeship, AmeriCorps kinds of experiences, uh, both in the middle of the educational process as we understand it here, sometimes between what we think of as high school and college, um, you know, a gap year, but a gap year where you are learning something and doing something that matters, not backpacking around Southeast Asia. Not that that's a bad thing to do. But um, what kinds of programs can the government put in place to encourage the kinds of self-growth, self-education? Uh, because, again, what, the day you graduate from university, is the most important day in your education because that's the day that you own it. What are you seeing in some of the programs around the world? And am I right in perceiving the Europeans are in a pretty good place, particularly in Northern Europe on some of these programs? And, you know, I started to look at this before my time at Lumina. I'm, I'm now in my, uh, somehow I'm in my 15th year as a CEO right. of Lumina. Um, but before my time, I started looking at these models. I, you know, I, I'm a sort of typical American in some ways, which is I spent a part of my life believing that we have the best system of higher education in the world. And in some ways, I think we do. We certainly have some of the best institutions. But from a systems perspective, I think there's a lot we can learn from the rest of the world. And to your point, particularly Europe, you know, one of the things that happened with the advent of the European Union and then subsequently a sort of broader set of collaborations is that something called the European Higher Education Area was created. So this is a, a collaboration of more than 40 nations, so well beyond the membership of the EU, 
where there is a common understanding of what credentials mean, you know, what uh, is behind the connection between what credentials you need and what kinds of work you can do. And because of the nature of work in the European context, where people have a right to work in other um, uh, European countries, mm -hmm. these systems allow them some flexibility, some movement that, that's really important. And key to that, to your point, is that in many of these countries, France, for example, um, they have service um, elements that are an important part of, of the learning system. Or in the case of the UK, Germany, and others, they've got really good apprenticeship models that I think are key to this idea that learning takes place in lots of different contexts in lots of different ways. And uh, to me, it's all part of that ecosystem that we really need to be developing so that people don't see learning as a one-and-done phenomenon. They see it as a part of a lifelong, ongoing process of learning, earning, and, and serving um, others. And to me, you know, again, I'm sort of uh, redundant on this point, but it's as important to us as individuals as it is to us as a, as a society. In fact, you know, one of the uh, quotes I've, I've uh, heard from you before is, you know, no one of us is as smart as all of us thinking together. You know, I think it's a, a really well said sort of concise way to, to think of it. You know, what, what are the ways from your perspective that we, we should be reimagining the world of work going forward? How, how, how has this pandemic maybe given us some, some windows, uh, as terrible as it's been, into these new opportunities that we might have? I'm going to jump to that, but first I just want to make a concluding point on what we just talked about, these apprentice programs, these blended work study, this personal responsibility piece. All of it creates opportunities that I think would help unwind some of the uh, some of the sectors in the United States that are underserved and have contributed, therefore, to these culture wars, which are pulling the country apart. And I think that um, the more we can drive opportunity to every community where it's not fully embedded, and that can be in Appalachians or inner cities or anywhere in the country, I think that is part of the solution to the national challenge we face. And I, I think that is um, an, important, an important point to make. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. So, you know, I, I want to um, go back to something we were talking about before, because I, I think it's, uh, you know, about, about our common heritage, right? So we're, we're both sort of straddling first generation, second generation uh, Greek Americans. And, and we talked a little bit about uh, what that instilled in us from a, from a value perspective. Talk a little bit from, from your perspective about what that immigrant experience is like for people who don't um, um, have that experience and also how it shaped you and how it shapes us as a society, um, as a nation of immigrants going forward in thinking about how we should be thinking about human work, national security, some of these big issues that are so critical to our long-term success. Well, let me tell you one thing that it, it deeply embedded in me that was valuable in my long career in the military, and it was an appreciation for the challenges that drive people to leave their homes. In other words, very few people wake up on a Tuesday morning and say, I live on this beautiful island called Crete, and you know everything is wonderful, but you know what? I've always wanted to break my life apart and move to the United States of America. That's not how it works. If people are satisfied where they are, typically they stay there. So in the case of my family, they were actually Turks, or excuse me, they were Greeks, ethnic Greeks, who lived under Turkish rule in the Ottoman Empire. And in 1922, when the city of Smyrna, today called Izmir, was burned, they were driven out of the city, rescued by Greek fishermen, and came to Athens across the Aegean. And then, having no life left, they were literally standing in the clothes that they possessed. And my, my grandmother clutching an icon that's what they came to Athens with, and eventually they made their way to the United States through Ellis Island. So first and foremost, it, it, it has given me an appreciation for what the refugees go through coming out of places like Syria, Sub-Saharan Africa, across an India-Pakistan border during the, the transition, an appreciation for that. And also, and I, I know you'd agree with this, 
an appreciation for what those kind of people can bring to their new country. And so I look at the Greeks who came here under whatever circumstance and look at what they've achieved in our nation. And so today when I see Syrians, a million Syrians are taken in by the Germans and there's a lot of angst and controversy about that. But I'll guarantee you this, that first generation of Syrians is going to go and open a shawarma shop in Potsdam. The next generation, they are going to be leading startups third generation, there'll be a Syrian German running Audi. I guarantee it. Why? Because those people who make that journey, who survive that journey, they are the ones who have the courage and the determination, the creativity, the will, the true grit to grab their four-year-old's hand, put their two-year-old's on their back, and walk across Turkey get on a boat and somehow get here, I want that person on my team. It's the hunger games out there. And these are the ones you want, the ones who get there. So first and foremost, Jamie, the immigrant experience is, has given me a deep appreciation for the importance of understanding um, how valuable these immigrants can be for all of our societies. And number two, um, what it has given me is an appreciation for this country for the opportunities it affords. And you know, here we can get into controversial discussions about border control and should we control our borders? Of course. But should we also have a process that allows these immigrants to come here to apply for refugee status, to join our nation? Because that's who we are. And we ought to be proud of that as, an Ameri as, a, as Americans. And, and I'll close, by the way, on a small anecdote, which is 1922, my grandparents are refugees coming out of Izmir uh, to the United States, 1922. In 1992, 70 years later, I came back to Turkey as the captain of a billion dollar U.S. warship. They left in a fishing boat. I came back as the captain of a billion dollar warship. And what happened in the middle? The United States of America. So those are the two things that I take away from my uh, parents' and grandparents' experiences coming here. I mean, it's such a powerful story, Jim, about the, the trajectory of what happens. It, it is the American story. It, it is our, our shared experience, our, our shared heritage as, as, as Americans. So powerful, so, so important. I, I, I can't uh, not uh, go down the path a little bit deeper on your military uh, experience and background. It's, it's been a key part of, of your um, uh, adult life. Um, I have not served in the military, though I have uh, lots of military experience in my family, including, interestingly, uh, my, my dad. So uh, sitting right here on my desk at Lumina Foundation is a, is a tattered photocopy of the war journal that my dad, who was a World War II veteran, kept. Uh, when he was um, held in captivity for, for 19 months after being shot down uh, as part of the uh, Arm, Army Air Corps. And uh, it's very powerful to see the perspective of your 19, 20-year-old father's view of the world, someone who was uh, sort of uh, very uh, sheltered, you know, grew up in a rural area in New Hampshire, suddenly found himself thrust into a war, shot down in one of his first missions, and it shaped his life. It shaped the trajectory of, of his life. Where was he, he, never, where was he um, held prisoner? In Germany, Italy? Well, it's a, it's a complex story for, for, a, for another uh, conversation, but he was actually held by the Swiss, uh, as were 1,100 other Americans, and uh, under not very good conditions. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a, a, a book about this, uh, a, about the experience of them. And uh, my father was fortunate because the... Uh, the uh, skill that he had, he was a guitar player. He, his father taught him um, how to play the guitar. And actually, his guitar playing allowed him to gain some uh, benefits mm. that uh, some of his uh, other you know, people held in captivity were not because his, literally his skill, his developed skill, gave him some benefits. They, they had real problems with access to food, yeah, resources, yeah. other things. The Swiss were in a very tough, uh, tough situation. And so... You know, to me, the the, uh, the military experience is, is so defining. And, and one of the things that I think is interesting that many Americans don't understand is that 
the military is both a place where you get educated, but also a place where many people in the military have education either because they got there. You know, most officers hold college degrees, for example. So, you know, to me, there's lessons between what we've tried to learn at Lumina Foundation about this idea that all learning should matter irrespective of where it's developed and the fact that the military is, I think, an underappreciated part of, of the learning system. So, so, Jim, what's the military doing right, and how can we maybe get the rest of the country to learn more from the model of valuing and promoting learning as part of the military experience? Well, you've got it right, Jamie. The military is an enormous university unto itself that really begins by grabbing 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds, fresh out of high school. And, and today, to join the military, essentially, you have to have a high school diploma. You've got to be physically fit. You have to have eschewed drug use. Um, it's a relatively tough cut to get into the military, as it should be. And so the, the learning machine starts at that level, high school graduates, and then teaches them values, teaches them about the country, teaches them to care about the shipmates on their left and their right, um, teaches them about a chain of command, about integrity. There's a value portion to this. And then it teaches real skills. And that is everything from uh, communication, how to uh, make yourself understood, how to make yourself heard, how to use technology to communicate better. It teaches how to use the internet. It teaches, obviously, the combat skills that are necessary, the physical fitness. Um, it teaches a wide variety of these kind of skill sets. It then picks up uh, when people are coming out of college um, and does the same thing for 22-year-olds who are going to go into the officer corps. As you said correctly, almost all officers begin with a college degree. And then I think a lot of Americans would think, well, that's probably about it. They have the boot camp, they have the uh, right out of college kind of thing for the officers, and then off they go to fly their planes and drive their submarines around and drive their destroyers at sea and all of that. No. Um, in the military, you are constantly part of an educational cycle that is as um, simple as a squad of a dozen Marines sitting in front of the sergeant who is going through an updated uh, segment of conversation about how to avoid radicalization on the internet to mid, uh, in the middle of your career, typically as an officer, you'll go to war college for a year of graduate study. It's really a master's degree level. Um, the Navy, for example, in my case, when I was 26 years old, after five years of sea duty, sent me to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy as a graduate student and put me through my PhD there over the next uh, two to three years. So the military continues this, and, and I'll close on this by saying, back to the point we were making earlier about you own this education, um, each of the military services, um, each of the major combatant commands puts out a reading list, pretty significant one that explains the books, has links to how to understand them, um, and in many cases, uh, mandates. Um, you have to read at least one or two at each level. It has a basic, a medium, an advanced level. Um, the, the military highly values education for all the reasons we've been talking about. And I think that um, in terms of lessons for the rest of the country, I'd say it is that idea that learning is continuous, that there is self-responsibility in learning, but that there is also has to be some kind of structure put in place that can help direct and steer your point, Jamie, about getting over the rough pla places in the career path. Education is a big part of that in the military as well. To me, there's this uh, virtuous cycle, right? Mm -hmm. That you've got to you've got to learn, uh, you've got to um, get experiences. Those experiences and that learning should be recognized. You have to come back to it over the course of, of your, your entire career. And it's that, it's that ecosystem that I talk about that's really important uh, of learning and earning and serving others that I think is key to us as, 
as human workers in, in, in the modern era. And, you know, frankly, I think the military's um, experience with learning is probably undervalued mm. by too much of society. We, we have some, some good examples in higher education of colleges and universities recognizing the learning that takes place in, in the military when people exit and, and uh, you know, join the civilian workforce. But too often, uh, they show up on our college campuses and they say, you know, welcome to your freshman year. And it strikes me as a, as a missed opportunity for the formal learning system, in this case, higher education, to do a better job of recognizing all of those things that the military is providing to people. Uh, there is some back and forth, as you point out. Your own experience is a good example of being able to go to Fletcher and get your PhD, et cetera. But too often, people who are maybe not officers um, end up exiting the military, um, coming back into the civilian world, and they face a, a lot of uh, barriers, I think, uh, barriers that are, to me, unacceptable in a world where the demand for talent is rising. We need to do a better job of developing and deploying that talent and yet we miss the opportunities to recognize what takes place in the military. Yeah, let me, let me add a thought there, which is a hopeful one, and, and, and you are well aware of it. Many colleges, and particularly community colleges, I think, which I think are undiscovered treasures in this entire ecosystem. Um, here in my hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, um, the, the Florida uh, College of uh, the, the Florida Junior Community College system here is very, very strong and really led by a remarkable individual, and I, I highly commend it as an example, one of the larger systems in the country. Agreed. Um, having said that, many of these um, institutions of higher education are, in fact, hiring senior retired military to shepherd veterans and become Sherpas for them. A lot of schools now have these veterans coordinators, and um, I've seen that very effectively at huge universities. Arizona State, I think the largest in the country, has such a program in place, down to the community college level. But it's gonna require, here's your point, um, making sure that we figure out ways to get them, the veterans, through these broken places in the system so they can then turn around, bring others through, and, and above all, contribute to the country. Jim, one, uh, maybe one more question for you, if I can, about uh, with your uh, retired military leader hat on, which is, um, you, know, you and I talked earlier about the important role of technology and what we've learned in the pandemic about technology. And of course, the, the military um, uses technology, benefits from artificial intelligence, in many ways has been leading in that front for for a long time. Um, it'd be interesting, I think, uh, to hear a little bit from you about what we should be learning from your perspective about AI, about the use of technology um, in these um, higher ed contexts as uh, we, again, you know, I, I mentioned in, in my human workbook this idea that we should be looking at uh, human-machine complementarity. In other words, this idea that what humans can do is complementary to what the machines can do and vice versa mm. and figure out how we develop our uniquely human traits, characteristics, and abilities in a way, in ways that benefit us as individuals and all of us as a society. So, so how does the, the military experience with AI and technology maybe help us think about this going forward from the higher ed perspective? Yeah, let me start with uh, kind of the good news. Um, the military is indeed very focused on this. And your point and your book is, is perfect on this, um, which is how do we put these two capabilities alongside each other, the smart machines alongside the, the human intuition, judgment, ethics, morality piece of this. So I'll give you a couple examples. Um, first would be very prosaic, but I think applies, um, which is in the world of maintenance. We have the largest fleet of vehicles in the world, the largest fleet of planes in the world, we, the Department of Defense. By using artificial intelligence, we can far more accurately predict when we need to do preventative maintenance so that we don't have a failure out in the field. And, and this, of course, is um, a growing trend across all segments, but that kind of prosaic use of what a machine can do, which is crunch enormous, vast data fields, and then extract judgments about 
timelines and predictions. I think that's very, very important. That's kind of a prosaic but very practical use that I think applies across. Second thing the military is doing, which I think also applies, and I don't see the civilian world doing this yet. We talked a moment ago about these supercomputers. What do they do? Among many other things, they overload us with information. We are constantly awash in this vast sea of information, and it's very difficult to parse out and to prioritize information that's coming in. We in the military are exploring how the commander who is in charge of the carrier strike group, and she doesn't have the ability to synthesize these vast fields of data that are constantly swirling around here, little bits of intelligence, um, previous patterns. A computer can do that. And it does it fairly well now. And boy, wait until we get to quantum computing. We move from the binary systems we have now, ones and zeros, to effectively infinite manipulation of um, atoms that will give our computers inexplicably enormous abilities. So we're using those to help the commander um, filter and prioritize information that's coming in. So those are two, I think, very practical ways in which the military is doing it that both apply to the civilian sector. I see the civilian sector doing the former, but as yet not so much the latter. They need to get there. The CEO of a, a company that I'm on, it's a huge utility, needs that kind of support. Uh, she has the support now uh, of, of looking at the metering systems and the trucks and the, the practical thing I talked about. But so far, we have not made the leap to give her the kind of ability to synthesize what's happening in the markets, what's happening globally to energy supplies, what's, what's happening in the United States that matters for the decision calculus she has about where to make that next dollar investment. Um, here's what we're not doing in the military, and I, I think you would, I, I know you would agree with this. We are not going to put a machine in a position to make a lethal decision. And, you know, let's face it, at, at the end of the day, militaries have to make life and death decisions about patterns of life, about uh, terrorist behaviors. Um, we are not going to turn over those kind of lethal decisions. There will always be, in my view, a human in the loop. But this is an example, Jamie, of where if our artificial intelligence had been better, I think we would not have had that terrible collateral damage example we had during the, the evacuation of Afghanistan, the fall of Kabul. You'll recall a U.S. drone strike killed an innocent family, killed a dozen uh, men, women, and children. And the reason was the human in the loop, frankly, got fixated on the type of vehicle and felt, oh no, this matches up with the terrorist report. If we could have had more artificial intelligence advising that human, I think we would have had a different and better outcome. So artificial intelligence in the military context is definitely a sword that cuts both ways. We need the human in the loop, but we need to take advantage of the ability to, to synthesize these vast fields of data. It'll allow us to reduce collateral damage, to fight in more humane ways if, God forbid, we are challenged and have to go into actual combat again. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful point because I think, uh, again, you know, we sort of see technology as a, as a really valuable tool. Machines are good at lots of things, speed, repetition, reduction to algorithm, uh, but humans can use technology to advance and, and um, use their own human traits and capabilities, their ethics, their compassion, their sense of judgment, et cetera, in ways that can complement what they can do. So it's not that the, there, there were two mistakes. One was, you know, maybe relying too much on the technology because, you know, what that person saw was a vehicle that matched what, what you know, they, they, they uh, previously understood as, as a threat. But if we had actually used the AI technology better, that human could have made better decisions Correct. and allowed them to understand that, in fact, 
those were civilians, and that uh, that was the wrong the wrong strike to make. So it's a, it's a really really good example, Jim, of of uh, things that we need to learn from our our experiences. Very difficult, painful things as we as we think about the the future. So um, you know we're um, we're coming towards the close of of uh, our time. I wanted to ask you a little bit about. Uh, the future, but uh, be- before I ask you about that, I, or maybe this is a segue to the future. You 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 have a, a new book. It's it's your first novel, um, and which is wonderful. And and I know you've said we learn a lot from from reading fiction. That in fact the world of of fiction allows us to think in different ways. So well, t- tell us a little bit more about that and and how you think we can learn more from fiction because you and I are both people who are largely grounded in in reality we're current affairs guys right but but at the end of the day I do think that the world of fiction is very important in helping to shape how we think about the future going forward it is Jamie and and here I think the the one word I would un- underline is imagination if you really think of a big national disasters for the United States um, Pearl Harbor 9-11, the pandemic. Um, in many ways, these are not failures of intelligence. We sort of knew that those threats were looming out there, but it was a failure of imagination. And, and, and indeed, the 9-11 Commission, as it put all the pieces together, said that, that 9-11 was not a failure of intelligence. It was a failure of imagination. So the point of my novel, 2034, a novel of the next world war, was to illuminate for the American public um, in a fictional setting what might happen in the year 2034, not as predictive fiction, but as cautionary fiction. In other words, I want people to imagine how terrible a war with China would be. Look, 2034, a novel of the next world war, is not... Tom Clancy. Tom Clancy is good guys fight bad guys, good guys win normally in the last five minutes. You know, this is not that novel. To the degree there are good guys and bad guys, there's only one villain, and the villain is war itself. Both the United States and China come away from this conflict deeply diminished, as they would in the real world. So it's a work of cautionary fiction. And Jamie, if you think back, you and I are old enough to remember the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Um, It was that cautionary fiction of books like Dr. Strangelove and films like Dr. Strangelove and Fail Safe and The Bedford Incident. These helped us imagine how terrible a war would have been with the Soviet Union, and that creates a kind of deterrence. So I think imagination can be a very powerful force, and, and people say to me sometimes, well, you know, you wrote nine books of nonfiction. Why didn't you just write a nonfiction book about how dangerous a war with China would be. And the answer is bigger audience, get to more people, stretch the imagination. And so that was the genesis of the book. And, and thanks for asking about it. Uh, 2034, a novel of the next world war, it hit number six on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, it's being published in 22 different languages so far. Um, we're north of, of several hundred thousand copies. You know, it's not Stephen King, but we're, we're, <laughs> we're, set, we're moving books. And, um, and, and by the way, we're in conversation with Netflix about turning it into a Netflix series. Um, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that'll happen. So, uh, and, and lastly, we have signed a two-book sequel to 2034, 2054, and 2074, 20. 54, you'll like this, Jamie, is about artificial intelligence, about the challenges, the benefits that provides, backdrop, a lot of civil tension in the United States. And 2074 is about climate, about what it could look like, again, cautionary tale, if we don't address those climatological problems we face today. So it's fun being a novelist. I I wouldn't say I'm uh, headed toward Ernest Hemingway or William Faulkner, <laughs> but I'm proud of my book and I'm I'm proud of of the next two volumes that'll be out over the next couple of years. Well done. That that's really exciting to hear that there that there's more to come on that, Jim. And uh, I can't help but note that you mentioned Doctor Strangelove. My my son is a freshman at Georgetown, and we were just talking uh, recently about Doctor Strangelove and. And his observation, I thought, was interesting from the 18-year-old perspective was 
he said it, it seems like that world is still part of the reality we're facing now. I said, yeah, you know, it's a fictionalized view, but in fact, it's a really astute observation that uh, some of the things that come up in Dr. Strangelove, I think, are very uh, prescient even about our, our modern uh, modern reality. So, yeah, starting, starting with uh, Vladimir Putin is consciously trying to recreate the Soviet Union. I mean, exactly. he's really going back into all of the currently independent countries, which were part of the Soviet Union, and frankly, the only three that are resolutely outside his grasp are the three Baltic states who have joined NATO. But the rest of those former Soviet republics, all of the stands, obviously Ukraine, Belarus, all of them, Putin is moving, moving, moving. So um, he's very prescient. And, and of course, we're also deeply concerned, and we should be, about proliferation of nuclear weapons, inability to control them. Um, these are all issues that are still on our plate today. Absolutely right. Any other books, uh, recent books you recommend to our uh, to our audience? Things that you're. Uh, I understand you read a lot of books. I think I read somewhere that you read a hundred books a year. I do. Um, I don't read a hundred books a year, Jim. I but I, I read a lot of books. And <laughs> so, besides twenty thirty four, and of course, human work in the age of smart machines. Any <laughs> any books you would recommend uh, people read? Uh, I just finished uh, the autobiography of Billie Jean King the tennis player, oh. and I highly recommend it. Now, you know, I played tennis in college for Navy. I actually hit some tennis balls with Billie Jean uh, as a very young guy when she was running a tennis camp in Lake Tahoe in the 1970s, early 1970s. So I'm a tennis aficionado, but that's not why I recommend the book. The book is a time machine back to the 60s and 70s. It's beautifully realized. It's a coming-of-age novel about a complicated woman who finds her sexuality later in life um, and wears it proudly. It's a great sports story. Rem remember the battle of the century between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs? Um, you know, Bobby Riggs has said a woman can never beat a man on a tennis court. Um, it's a wonderful book, and her voice is so genuine and fresh. Um, it's called All In by Billie Jean King. Highly recommend it. Fantastic. What a great recommendation. I will definitely uh, get that. Uh, I want to close with a, a question, sort of uh, moving the lens back out again for, for a moment about where we are as a society when it comes to racial justice and equity. And you talked about uh, Billie Jean King and, and her experiences as a woman, um, as, a, as a gay woman. Um, you know, those experiences, I think, are connected to what we're experiencing in terms of equity broadly in American society. And certainly when it comes to racial equity and, and justice. Um, you know, we are experiencing, I think, uh, a resurgence of, of um, racial bias, um, these um, uh, moments when we recognize that uh, the centuries-long um, uh, efforts to keep uh, black, Latino, or Hispanic, Native American uh, citizens um, um, uh, down when it comes to to their advancement in American society, still exists in our society, still an important part of, of what we need to deal with. Lumina Foundation has described itself as an equity-first organization. We try to hold ourselves publicly accountable, both in terms of the work that we're doing externally and, and how we live our lives as an organization. Um, you've been a, a part of this journey of racial justice and equity you know, over the course of your career in the military, in higher education, now in your work in the private sector and, of course, as the chair of the Rockefeller Foundation. Tell me a little bit about your view of where you think we are when it comes to racial equity and justice and, and what we can do better going forward to actually eliminate uh, these, uh, these uh, longstanding biases that I think uh, not only hold back people of color in the United States, uh, but hold all of us back in terms of our shared well-being and, and shared prosperity. Jamie, you make all the right points, and, and I know you would agree with me that the good news is we've made tremendous progress. We have made tremendous progress, and we can't lose sight of that. Look at where we were on those issues 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. We have made tremendous progress. Now, we are not where we need to be. And we have hard, hard work to do ahead of us. And I think that the nation is waking up to it. And therefore, I think, 
and your foundation itself is so well titled Lumina, the giving of light. You know, in, in Spanish, the expression for giving birth is dar la luz, to give the light. And I think that that applies not simply to giving birth, but in many ways to giving birth in our society to better ideas of racial justice. Opportunity, I think, is so crucial here. And I want to make one other point. Um, you correctly mentioned all of the racial categories. I think we still have immense work to do in gender, in helping women. And again, we need to stipulate we've made tremendous progress. Look at where women were 30 years ago, barely in the boardrooms of this country. Look at where they were 50 years ago when it was an incredible moment when women were allowed to come on to combat operations in the military. Look where women were 100 years ago. They didn't have a vote. They were chattel in our society. And frankly, as I look at 50% of the world in so many parts of the world, still disenfranchised, not at the table, not moving in the right direction. So I think it's not only the racial injustice we need to work, but also the gender equality. And I'll, I'll close with this, which is that 300 years from now, when someone writes the history of this century, um, a lot of the things we've talked about here today are going to be important. You know, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, uh, the rise of China, climate, all those things will be important, how we deal with them to include racial justice. I think a historian 300 years from now, writing about the 21st century, it'll be about the rise of women. In this century, this century, we still have 80 years to go, I think you really are going to see women fully enfranchised globally. That, to me, is the most optimistic thing about our position today, is the upside, the potential of what women who finally fully get vested in this society could bring us. Stay tuned for that. Well said, and I'll close simply with my own observation here that uh, combating uh, injustice, inequity, and in all of their forms, I think requires a high quality learning system that not only advances a common value set to understand why bias, why discrimination, why a lack of inclusion um, are wrong, both for individuals and society, that, that high quality learning system has to be key to it. Uh, we have to not only transmit those values as part of the learning process, but we also have to live those values in the higher ed system as an example, a model for what others um, need to do. So, Jamie, I have one last thought, if I may. It's a very quick one. You were nice enough yes. to compliment the military and compliment me on my service. And I appreciate that. People say that a lot to me. Admiral, thank you for your service. Our educators are serving this nation in every sense as important, as dramatically, and are the key to our future uh, as well. So to the high school teachers in rural Alabama working for $32,000 a year, to the professors at the leading universities, to people like you, Jamie, leading educational foundations and efforts, I want to close my part by saying thank you for your service. Thank you very much. And um, I'm an optimist by nature, even uh, in the face of, of all of the challenges we're facing as a society. So we're going to end on that optimistic note and say uh, thank you very much, Admiral James DeVritis. This has been wonderful. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your friendship. And uh, what a wonderful conversation. Uh, thrilled to be with you. Thanks, Jamie.